All right, today I'm going to talk about asset protection and asset protection trusts, particularly foreign asset protection trusts. And I'm going to be going over the biggest mistakes that I see uh, time and time again in how people talk about the subject and how they're set up and ultimately why they fail. And that's what matters at the end of the day. If we're talking about using international corporate structuring and, and trust structures for the purpose of asset protection and wealth preservation, if it fails, it was a complete waste of time. So the only goal in establishing these things is for it to work and for it to work with the highest degree of certainty, ideally 100% of the time. And most of the structures I do see out there and most of the commentary I see around asset protection trusts uh, do not meet the, the standard that I would be comfortable with, the standard that my company is comfortable with, and more importantly, the standard as is explicitly described within case law when we see people actually get hemmed up for their improperly established or improperly conducted asset protection trust structures. So once again, I'm Evan Thompson. I'm the president of UTC and I'm the chairman of Dominion. Um, I advise ultra high net worth serial entrepreneurs through Dominion and our law firms around the world help people secure cash, property, and equity within asset protection trusts and other legal structures. Our team has hundreds of years of combined experience and to date our clients have never lost money through any of our structures. So what I'm describing to you today um, has worked and has worked for a long time uh, for everybody I work with within the Dominion Group, which operates in the US, multiple jurisdictions around the world. You know, we're probably coming to a place near you anytime. So um, the biggest mistakes I see. So the first one is this idea, and I, and I hear this with a lot of entrepreneurs because they're not focused on law, right? That's typically not their background. Um, they're not focused on complex finance structures. There's the idea of, okay, once we set this up, then we're good, right? Set it up and we're good. That's never the case. Um, unless fundamentally you never want to use it. I guess if you never want to use it, if you're to say, I'm going to set up a trust, I'm going to move uh, $15 million into that and I'm done. I'm never going to touch it. I don't need distributions. Uh, this is simply just to pass on money to my children when I die. If that's what you're doing, then okay, sure. Like th then the setup is relatively simple. Um, this is a very cut and dry thing. We set it up properly, of course, and I'm gonna go through what proper means um, in greater detail soon. But if you're setting up that structure to never use it, right? There's never going to be distributions throughout. You're never going to be looking at potentially owning companies under that structure or within that structure. You're never looking at taking out any alternative form of distribution, whether this is through annuities, investment income, insurance, and, and private placement life insurance policies. If you're never looking to do anything like that, even taking just a personal distribution to buy property or something, then yeah, then the setup is, is pretty much going to be fine. When we're talking about the actual administration of a trust, assuming that the client actually wants to receive distributions, they want to be able to um, participate in that wealth, not only have it uh, structured properly and have it offshore and have it secured and have it away from them, but also still be able to receive benefit in an appropriate way over time, and that's what almost every client I work with wants, then there's no such thing as set up and we're good. Now, this is what a lot of people try to sell you. They try to sell you, we get your trust set up for you, and then you never have to worry about it. Well, I would say we get your trust set up for you. You don't have to worry about it. However, it is in accordance with the proper governance of this trust. And this is where we get into a lot of details. How do you communicate with your trustee or advisors on that trust? Are you exhibiting any type of control over the trust? Um, are you taking out distributions that would be considered fair and reasonable? Are these distributions spread across one or multiple individuals? What I'm doing is I'm thinking in terms of what a judge is going to look at and what a prosecuting attorney is going to look at if somebody is now suing you. These are the questions that they're going to ask, right? So it's about continuous management of your trust and continuous uh, effective distributions that conform to what case law says um, in the relevant jurisdiction. If we focus in on the U.S. here, there's tremendous case law in America on trusts, asset protection trusts that were not seized, that stood up to legal scrutiny, and then there's trusts that were seized um, or they had their settlers uh, thrown in jail for contempt. This is what we don't want to happen to you. The way in which you avoid that is through proper management of the trust over time, and that's never going to be a case, again, unless you never want to touch it, right? But if you do want to touch it, if you want some interaction with that, if you want distributions uh, from that, if you want to function as a beneficiary um, of that trust in some way, then this is never about set up and it's done. This is about the continuous process to ensure 
that every single inter interaction that you are going to have with the trust is done in the proper way so as not to trigger um, a potential legal event should you actually get sued and have those assets under consideration in a court of law, all right? So that's the first thing that we have to get away from. It's not set up and we're good. It's set up, that's the beginning. And then it's fundamentally about management over time. If anybody is trying to say, hey, here's a great jurisdiction to set up a trust, Cook Islands, Nevis, Panama, something like that. If anybody's saying that, hey, the trust law is good. Great, their trust law is good. How does your home jurisdiction, where you're operating your businesses, where you have your properties, where you're looking to live your life, and where you are liable for litigation or concerned about that, how does that jurisdiction look at how you personally are receiving benefit from a offshore asset protection trust? If that benefit is done the wrong way, then the asset protection will not hold up independent of where you have registered that trust or how you have registered that trust. Okay, so that's the first one. The second big mistake I see is jurisdictional obsession. Um, I, I'm sure there's other ways that we could say this, but when we see too much focus on what is the best jurisdiction for an asset protection trust? Okay, well, there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, we work in several. Um, we're constantly looking for more jurisdictions that are changing their laws and having more equitable trust law um, to benefit our clients. And then some jurisdictions change. Some jurisdictions used to be better and now they're worse. These laws change over time. And then case law within your country with respect to those trusts, with respect to international law, with respect to the jurisdictional law in other countries also changes over time. So these are things to be constantly aware of. The point is that if you're going into an idea of, I want a trust, I want to set it up and be done with it. And this is the best jurisdiction. So I'm going to go here and then that's it. Again, this is a very unsophisticated way of going about this process. When you want an asset protection trust, you're not thinking about the next six months, you're thinking about the next 60 years and possibly beyond. So what is the correct framework or what is the correct position to take on how to think through that process? And you can't start with a originating frame of this is the best jurisdiction. Okay, for now, maybe like it's a, the way I see it, there are good and healthy jurisdictions for asset protection trusts. We are confident in the laws of several countries. Again, these would be Nevis, Cook Islands, Panama, British Virgin Islands, Belize, but that's weakening a little bit. Cayman kind of sucks right now. Mauritius is, is, is pretty good. Liechtenstein is interesting in certain cases, but most cases are not. Bermuda is okay. You know, so there's a few more that we could talk about. Cyprus, you know, uh, Seychelles is all right, you know, and they're kind of improving. But so there's a lot of these jurisdictions that have healthy trust laws. Um, but they have changed over time. Uh, some have been very stable over the past 30 to 40 years. Uh, th this is why you probably see, you know, Nevis and Cook Islands brought up regularly. And those are great places. That's why we work there. But at the same time, we're not married to that jurisdiction, right? In so many other places, they've built their house there. They've built their entire firm there. That's where they live. If the laws were to become less conducive, well, they're not incentivized to start to tell you, hey, this is no longer that healthy of a place. So my position and the position of Dominion is we're going to be working everywhere. We're going to work in every jurisdiction because we never want to have a preferential jurisdiction by inertia or by design. Right now, we've got our places that we prefer to work, but it's also based upon where you're from. It's based upon what business activity you're conducting. It's based upon what type of assets you're trying to secure. Every single one of those details matters in terms of what is the most appropriate um, asset protection trusts or trusts or plus international corporate structure and then other types of legal vehicles that we can use. What's the best combination of policies to maximize your level of asset protection, maximize your level of benefit from that, minimize your taxes, and minimize any type of liability that you would have? That's what we're trying to accomplish in all of these things. And once again, if you're just thinking, boom, here's the best jurisdiction, well, that's not. You're, you're not going to achieve that standard of result. That's the only standard of result I'm interested in operating under. Our clients appreciate that. If you're a ultra high net worth individual, I would assume that that would be the only standard you'd accept either. Uh, another biggest mistake here, and this is probably the number one mistake um, that I do see unquestionably, and this is clients who ultimately want to retain control. So asset protection, the most basic theory of asset protection, other than anything else, jurisdictions, laws, setup, any of that, the most basic theory comes to just one question. Who controls the assets? If you control those assets, it's not asset protection, okay? So if a firm is saying, 
don't worry, we'll set up a trust. It's following their laws and you can be the trustee. It's not asset protection. You just paid a bill for a service that you're not getting. You're not achieving anything there, right? So if you want to control those assets, you do not have asset protection. That's very, very black and white. Um, the case law is very significant on this, right? You can read Henry Lawrence um, from 2002. Again, he uh, had control over the trust, um, then distanced himself after a lawsuit. The judge determined that he would have been able to repatriate those assets at the time. So contempt until you, you know, fix that problem. You read Henry Turner from 2005. Again, another situation not properly set up in the same way. You can read Waldron v. Huber from 2013. Again, very similar situation where there's, we can list off case law all day, that this is the most common thing. Consistently, judges find that people set up trusts, but technically they retain control in some way, shape, or form. And therefore, if they have control and you're being sued and, the, and they're trying to say, you have to pay us all this money and your claim is, nope, I don't have the money. It's in a trust. It's often a trust. The judge is going to say, okay, great. It's often a trust. Now, who controls that trust? Do you, the person who's being sued, who's saying you don't have that money, do you technically control that in some way, shape, or form? They're going to find it, all right? If you do, it's not asset protection. It's just an expensive offshore bank account, an offshore legal vehicle. Why did you pay for it if you weren't actually setting up a legitimate asset protection plan? And then this also pertains to these ridiculous bridge trusts that I hear about. Um, it's just, it's a joke. I, like, it's, you will be the trustee until legal action strikes against you then the system changes. Once again, that is basically what all the case law says. The person being sued, the person being attacked by a creditor, had a trust, they were the trustee or something to the effect, then they got sued, then they changed the trustee. Okay, the judges consistently look at that in a very, very simple manner. There's, I see no variation or deviation on um, their interpretation of the matter. They're saying, Day one, you owned it. Day two, you got sued. Day three, you changed the structure so you no longer have control, okay? When you got sued, you could have repatriated those assets to pay the claim, and you changed it afterward. That's fraudulent conveyance, and until you solve that situation, we're going to throw you in jail for contempt. Once again, having your assets protected while you're sitting in jail, I also don't consider that a legitimate asset protection plan, but when people say you can be a trustee or you can change it later, this is not a legitimate claim. Um, I don't know why people still do this. Once again, it doesn't matter what the law in Nevis or Cook Islands or Panama or British Virgin Islands or Cyprus, it doesn't matter what any of those laws say. What are the, how is the judge in the place where you're being sued? How do they interpret that law? How does it interact with that set of laws? You have to marry all of those principles up. So there, if you're the trustee, it's not going to work. You can't be the trustee. Also, your wife or husband or son or daughter or brother, or like <laughs> that's what people try to get around this. Oh, well, my trustee is, um, you know, my son. Like, okay, well, once again, that that's judges don't look at that as a legitimate independent trustee. They see that as being owned within the family. So once again, not going to work. Even I've, this can even go down to business partners. Sometimes that can be helpful in some cases for different types of nominee services. But from a trust perspective, if they find a, a route in there where it's like, well, technically you are controlling this in via, via somebody else, simply it's no longer asset protection. All you've done is set up a very expensive uh, program for yourself and you're going to go through a very expensive and long-winded legal case now because you've just made it more difficult and annoying. Judges get annoyed by this, and so they're not going to be um, very conciliatory to uh, any types of leniency that you would look for after this is all said and done. Um, a, another point that goes through, okay, so I won't be the trustee, but I'll appoint myself as a protector, or I'll appoint my wife or husband or brother or son or daughter or something as a protector, and the protector has the right to change the trustee. Okay, once again, same principle. All you've done is just kick the can down the road. Instead of directly controlling the trust or indirectly controlling it through somebody else, you're just indirectly, indirectly controlling the trustee through a protector. Judges are looking at that as, as the exact same thing. Okay, well, technically you have control. You can change the trustee at any time. We're ordering you to change the trustee. Now, this is a layer removed depending on the circumstances and depending upon the motivation of the person coming after you. That's not as much of a, um, a dangerous thing to do, but if you have a sufficiently motivated creditor coming after you, that is not going to be a shield. That's a wet piece of paper in front of somebody coming after you. Another area will be where you uh, put in the trust deed that the settler at their discretion or possibly under certain circumstances has the ability to change the trustee. 
once again, judges will look at that as you have retained control over the administration of the trust and therefore over the asset. So once again, I cannot emphasize this enough. If you retain control or you try to cleverly retain control or you try to double cleverly retain control, it's not going to matter. Did you retain control? Do you have control by any means over this trust? If you do, a sufficiently motivated prosecutor will find it and they're going to present that to the judge and over and over and over again in U.S. case law in particular, that situation is held up to your detriment, to the detriment of the asset protection trust. So anybody saying you can retain control, they're not offering you asset protection. They're just trying to charge you a five, ten thousand dollar fee, an inexpensive fee uh, for setting up a structure that fundamentally will not work when it matter. And that's, you know, you don't build a, a levy to protect ag against a one foot flood. You build it to protect against a hundred foot flood, a thousand foot flood. And that's how we should be thinking here. Another mistake is domestic trust. I'm not sure why people said a domestic trust. I, I think it's just a sales tactic. Like, hey, there's a group of clients that are just uncomfortable with offshore. So let's sell them something domestic. Okay, again, I get it from a sales perspective, but from a legal and substantive and, well, I guess I see it as the duty of any advisor, any legal advisor, any financial advisor, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility. They are required to operate in the best interest of the client. I couldn't ethically do that. And the reason why is because if a client comes to me, and this is what any client is saying, right? Any client interested in asset protection, they all will say the same thing. I have a concern at some point in time in the future that... I could get sued because I'm a person of significant wealth. Um, my risks are too high. And I don't want a stupid lawsuit to undo all this wealth that I've worked building my entire life. Again, boom, that's why you get asset protection. That's an extremely reasonable perspective to have. Okay, so that is what every single person is gonna say who's looking for asset protection. Now, should I offer them a legal structure in the country that they're worried about litigation? Or should I offer a legal structure not in the country where they're worried about litigation and specifically in a country whose laws are designed to protect that person to the maximum degree that is allowed. To me, this is a no brainer, right? But domestic trusts continue to get used. Once again, domestic trusts are great if you're looking at setting up a family estate plan. Um, if you have a few 10,000 or a few hundred thousand dollars, it's a more effective structure. It's cheaper, it's easier. But if you're worried about asset protection, if you're worried in the in the several millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and you have tremendous resources, assets, equities, and properties at risk, if you want your legal protection to be in the same country where you're worried about legal uh, threats, doesn't make sense. So it's just an insufficient and unsophisticated low tier tool um, to solve a high tier. And so you're not gonna get the result. Um, another mistake I see clients make is too late, right? The, the, the too late problem. I will, I'll do this when it becomes a problem. Okay, that is like buying fire insurance when your house is on fire. You buy fire insurance before your house catches fire. If you buy it a second before, you're gonna be protected. If you buy it the moment your house catches on fire, you're no longer going to be protected. If you're interested in asset protection, if you care about asset protection, if you're worried about asset uh, about your assets being exposed or at risk, then you have to set this up before you actually have a problem. And arguably, there's some different interpretations of this from time to time. It depends upon a lot of factors. And so I'd have to talk for an hour just to explain this one detail here. But arguably, in most cases, if you have any verifiable concern, like if you are worried about pending litigation, not just general risk, but like I can name the exact risk. I'm specifically worried that this person or this regulatory body is going to come after me for this reason. And you have documented evidence of that concern. Even then it's too late. So you got to be early. Like, so if, if you're worried about this, the earlier you set this up, the better, the more protect, the earlier you do it, the more protected you are. If you're in before anybody can make the claim that, hey, you only set this up to avoid this problem, this specifically named problem, right? If me and my team and, 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 and our lawyers are able to make the claim, nope, this was set up and there was nothing that we were looking at at risk, just the general risks that all wealthy people are exposed to, then they're not going to have a case. But if somebody's able to say, nope, here's emails, here's text messages, Here's the client saying over and over and over again, I'm worried of, about these specific situations. You know, I think I'll set up asset protection in order to avoid this. Boom, that is going to be considered fraud. That's what uh, the prosecutor will go for and they'll probably win 
um, even if we set everything um, up perfectly. Now, there's some things that we can do. I won't say what we can do, but there's some things that we can do to deal with that situation. Um, but that's our proprietary information. But the point is, is that the longer you, if you wait until there's a problem, then this is not a solution. All it will be is it will just be an additional expense. You paid for additional legal structures. You're going to drag out the case of the people coming after you because you've done this. And you're probably going to add more penalties because now you've, you've like committed, they're going to now go for an additional problem of fraud. So there you go right there. Um, and then I guess that I've, I've kind of spoken to this, but I, I guess I say the other problem that I see people do, and I was talking about this with respect to control, but I guess I call it people try to set up the cute trust. And by that, I mean the, I'm going to set up something clever, or I'm going to find a trust that has a cute little name and they have a cute little fancy way of going about it. I, I see this all over again. Like I see the, you know, the, the skip trust, the drum trust, the, this trademark thing, trust, uh, like the bridge trust, all of these things, I call them the fraudulent conveyance trusts because they're the textbook definition of fraudulent conveyance again, which is, you know, when you move your money after, you know, some type of a case or when you change structure after there's been a problem, I see people try to say like, nah, you know what? I don't believe because I can't fully understand every detail, which is insane because no entrepreneur in the world ever does that. No entrepreneur says, I need to understand every single detail of my company in order for it to operate. Zero entrepreneurs do that. But then when they have this conversation, some people, not all, none of my actual clients do this, but some of the people that I will speak to who often end up in problems later is they're like, you know what? I don't understand every single possible law with respect to asset protection, with respect to finance as it relates to it, with respect to taxes as it relates to it. So I'm going to go with a, a less expensive option, but I'm going to go with these people that have a cute little idea uh, about their trust. I'm going to, I'm smarter than the lawyers, right? Th th that's really what they're thinking. I think I'm more clever. I think I can save a buck on the structure that protects all of my money and all of my assets. I'm going to try to skim a dollar off of that bill in the, in my entire wealth defense strategy, which is nuts, but they set up these structures that they think are cute. Like, oh, I'm going to get away with something, you know, I'm going to move it through this company and then move it through that company and move it through this company. And they'll never catch up with me because that's what they do in Hollywood. Correct. That's what they do in Hollywood. It's not how it happens in the real world. Uh, when you set up an asset protection, um, an international corporate structure properly, um, part of it looks like Hollywood. Yeah. It's pretty fucking fancy. You're going to feel like James Bond, but at the same time, it's not exactly like that. There, there are proper ways to set these things up. There are ways that are very substantive and nobody I work with in the industry, nobody within Dominion Group uh, uses cute jargon and how they talk about trust or how they set up trust. They followed the law. Um, they obsess about the law and they use the law to their benefit and to the benefit of our clients. So what I would recommend is that, you, you know, you're not going to learn what it takes people in our company decades and decades, lifetimes to learn in terms of setting these things up and not to mention the experience we have in setting these things up for clients all around the world with very different needs, with very different business structures. Everything is tailored to them. That's what you're going to need. You're going to need something tailored to you and your circumstances. So if you don't want to follow the law and you go the route of setting up the cute trust where I'm, or the, the cute structure to, to try to protect your assets, you are basically gambling. And if you have a sufficiently motivated creditor, like a regulatory body or some, or a, a very, very pissed off business partner or an extremely fucking pissed off um, ex-spouse, um, then these cute plans are going to cause more headaches for you than anything that you could have ever imagined. So. Anyway, as a quick recap, the six things um, that I generally see people do um, that are mistakes. First one was set up and we're good. It's never like that. It's about the continuous management of that trust. If you ever want to interact with it, it's about how it's managed. Jurisdictional obsession. Again, there's many great jurisdictions. The ones that are great today weren't always great. The ones that were great before aren't as good now. Laws change. We have to pay attention to that. If you're obsessed with one, then, well, I, why? Why are you obsessed with one? That doesn't make sense. I assume you're obsessed about protecting your assets like we are. If you are, then you need to have a different perspective. A third area, people retain control either directly or indirectly or double indirectly, or they try to do something funny um, where technically they retain control. If you do, it's not asset protection. It's just an expensive leak structure. And number four, domestic trusts. Again, useful for some cases, not very useful for asset protection very incoherent for asset protection, I think is a better way to put it too, because if you're worried about domestic issues, why have protection there? Like use 
international law to your benefit. Number five, they do things too late. Again, judges look at this very differently. If you set up a trust one second before you get sued versus one second after, those are two very, very different realities. And then finally is, you know, trying to be cute, trying to be clever, trying to be smart, trying to think you can get away with something. Nope. Follow the law, follow the boring fucking details of the law. And uh, these things work. So thank you for listening. Um, I love asset protection. Um, that's all I do. That's the only thing that I do is um, advise on asset protection, corporate structures, and overall business planning um, for ultra high net worth serial entrepreneurs. It's a joy to do. It's a lot of fun. In my company, Dominion, we have law firms all around the world. Um, we have advisors and lawyers all around the world. This is all we do. Um, we don't do anything else. We don't serve any other clients. We don't set up family trusts for people with $200,000. We don't set up um, offshore companies for somebody to run um, their e-commerce shop. We set up bulletproof asset protection trusts set up properly in the boring legal terminology for people who are running seven, eight plus figure businesses around the world. Thank you.